In this tutorial, we are going to cover quasi-static elasticity with prescribed fault slip. For this example, we're going to consider a vertical cross-section of a reverse fault. Uh, we're going to have a rectangular domain that is 200 kilometers long in the x direction and 100 kilometers deep in the y direction. We have a main fault running through the middle that's a reverse fault. Uh, we have a splay fault coming off. And we're going to have three different materials. We're going to have a crust over here on uh, the, the, foot, the hanging wall. Then we're going to have the slab down here in the foot wall, and then the wedge in between the splay and the main fault. We'll have uh, boundary conditions on the minus x direction, minus y direction, and x positive direction. And these examples are covered in the directory examples reverse 2D. There are a total of eight steps in this example. In this tutorial, we're going to cover steps five, six, and seven that deal with fault slip and uh, earthquake rupture. Uh, the, the first one, step five, uses just one, the main fault. Step six will have earthquake rupture on both the main fault and the splay fault. And then step seven, we'll repeat step six, but we'll switch to an isotropic Maxwell viscoelastic rheology. And the first three steps and the first four steps are covered in the gravity uh, tutorial section. Uh, for this prescribed slip, the concepts we're going to cover are the generation of the mesh using G-mesh uh, and qubit. We'll have a variable mesh size that increases with distance from the fault. We'll cover both static and quasi-static simulations for elasticity, prescribed earthquake rupture, and prescribed slip on multiple faults, and both elastic and viscoelastic bulk rheologies. We're going to uh, generate our mesh first using G-mesh, and this is a schematic of the geometry that we are going to use. We will first create points, shown here in the orange dots. We'll have point one over here, point two, point three, and point four, showing the overall uh, domain. Then we will have uh, a series of points to construct the faults. We have point five, point six is the bottom edge of the main fault. Point seven is uh, its projection onto the ground surface. Eight is the end where the, the intersection between the splay fault and the main fault. Um, and then uh, point nine is where the splay fault reaches the surface. Uh, you'll notice that I have labeled all of the curves. We're gonna give the curves variable names. And in GMesh, curves have direction. So they go from the starting point to the end point. So around the perimeter of our domain, everything is going counterclockwise. Uh, and then the faults, we're gonna make our curves start at depth and go towards the surface. So you see all our arrows are pointed upward. Uh, when we connect the curves into surfaces, we have to take into account this orientation or direction of the curves. Um, and so we will connect them uh, in order uh, going around counterclockwise. And when we encounter a curve going in the opposite direction of what, where we want to go, we will use the minus value for, of its tag. And that indicates to GMesh to reverse its orientation. And I'll show you th this in the GMesh script. So as I mentioned, when we create a final mesh in GMesh using the, uh, using the built-in geometry engine, each curve in the GMesh has a direction. The direction is from the starting point to the ending point. When connecting curves into surfaces, you must connect the curves in a consistent direction. Uh, for all of our examples, we connect the curves in a counterclockwise direction. And as I mentioned, to reverse the direction of a curve, use the negative tag. So this is the mesh we're going to generate. And now let's look at the GMesh script that will uh, show us how we construct this mesh. So we use a Python, the Python interface to GMesh. Uh, this is, provides a nice user interface uh, and consistent um, with being able to use uh, all of the object-oriented aspects of Python, as well as we could, because GMesh is installed via pip, which is installed via the Python, uh, it's integrated into our entire pilot development environment. So we can bring in other uh, 
libraries and modules such as geographic projections and use them all within the Python um, for generating the GMesh uh, file. Uh, we have provided and included within PyLess some GMesh utilities. These make it much easier to generate a mesh um, because we've uh, provided sort of a higher level interface than what GMesh provides directly. So you have less duplicate code um, when you want to generate your mesh. We have a default uh, mesh script, and these are covered in the manual. It's uh, within the GMesh uh, utils uh, module. We provide a vertex group, material group, and a generate mesh application. So in our local script, we're going to inherit from that application, and that means that we only have to implement the portions of this application that aren't already provided. Um, and what that amounts to is uh, creating the geometry, marking the boundaries, and uh, generating the mesh. And so up front, I define the dimensions of our domain and the X direction. It's uh, 200 kilometers, Y direction, it's 100 kilometers. We're going to have a total main fault width for our main fault of 60 kilometers a dip of 35, a dip of the splay fault of 45, and we're gonna offset the, the surface trace of the splay 15 kilometers from the main reverse fault. Uh, within my constructor, I uh, say what the default cell type is and the choices. In this case, because I have a splay fault um, and reverse fault, it's much, uh, more suitable for generating the mesh using triangular cells rather than quadrilaterals. Uh, GMesh struggles a little bit uh, in terms of generating quadrilateral cells uh, when you have triangular shaped uh, subdomains and surfaces. I give it a default file name so that when I generate the mesh, it'll write it out uh, to that file. Now I create the geometry. So I'm going to define a couple variables. Create, create a local variable LX, that's the length in the X direction, LY for the length in the Y direction. Um, and then I just uh, give a, the coordinates of point one in my diagram. Um, so I'm gonna uh, center the domain in the X direction and have the surface at Y equals zero. So the bottom of my domain is uh, minus LY. Now I define my points. So I'm gonna define the points that go around the perimeter of the domain. Point one is at x1, y1. Point two uh, is at the lower right corner. So that's x1 plus lx, x1 plus lx, and x1 plus ly for point three. And the other corner of the domain is x1 and y1 plus ly. Um, so I've created those points. I haven't connected them to the curves or anything. I've just created those points. Next, I'm gonna create the points for the for the main fault, so I define a local variable y, I mean, sorry, w, that is the fault width. I give the fault dip, they're converting it into radians from degrees. And now I'm gonna create uh, my point, the coordinates of the points for x, for point six, point seven, uh, and then I'm gonna create my points five, six, and seven. So let's go back to our diagram here. And so I first created those four corner points, point one, point two, point three, point four. Now I'm doing five, six, and seven. So uh, here we are at point five, x is x1, the same as our corner, but we're down there at y of five. Point six, the coordinates are x6 and y6 defined right up here. That's based on uh, where the width of my fault is. Point uh, seven, I've defined it to be uh, start at x6 and then go up. Uh, same thing with um, y5 uh, being uh, based on my x and y coordinates. I find the, the length um, of down dip direction. Then I'm going to create. Uh, this variable that I'm going to use later, call, I want the end of the fault, that's the deepest part of the main fault. I save it uh, within my object as the point of the fault end. And this is just to make it easier to refer to that end of the fault, end of the fault when we need to mark uh, geometric entities for our boundary conditions. 
Now we need to create the points for the splay faults. So we have our dip in radians. We then calculate its width based on its offset and its intersection with the main fault. Uh, here we have what uh, the surface uh, trace x coordinate is based on where the main fault intersected plus our offset. We then compute based on just trigonometry the points for the intersection with the main fault. Then we define those points, just add them into our model, and we also save where our endpoint is for tagging the bottom edge of the boundary. Now we create our curves. And so for to create a curve, all we need, we're just, they're all straight line segments. So we use uh, add line. Uh, then we just give it the starting point and ending point. And so we just go around, uh, for example, our curve y negative is from point one to point two. So we see that uh, up here in our first line. Uh, and we're saving all of these curves into uh, the local object. That's what the self dot means. And that's just so that we can refer to them when we tag all our geometry for boundary conditions, because we need those curves uh, and information. So these are just storing the tags uh, that GMesh creates when it adds an entity. So you can see we have all of our different uh, boundaries. Then we create curve for the fault extension. That's points five to six. That's down here. Uh, we have our curve for our splay fault. Now that we have our curve, so that's defining all the curves. Now we want to connect those curves into a surface. So to generate a, a surface, we need to make the loop of the curve going counterclockwise. And so here for uh, my first surface, which is going to be that slab. So that's, um, let's go back here. So slab is the lower one. So this surface down here, I'm gonna start down here and go Y negative, X positive, Y positive on the foot wall, then the upper part of the fault, extension of the fault, and the negative on the foot wall. Um, so you'll see all of those curves right here in this little array uh, connected together. I create that curve loop and then I create, uh, I add a planar surface using that curve loop uh, and create my surface. And then I do the same thing for uh, the plate or the crust and then also um, uh, the wedge. Uh, and so you'll notice here that uh, I needed to go in the opposite direction for my splay fault when I connect the wedge. Also, uh, the top part of the fault, uh, I had to use negative because I wanted to reverse the direction of those curves when I connected them into a continuous loop. Once I have all my geometry, then I call the synchronize, uh, and that's just an internal uh, G-mesh function that makes sure that everything is consistent. Um, and uh, can under, and so that we can generate a mesh using that geometry. So uh, in contrast to qubit, we generally mark our, the geometry, geometric entities in GMesh before actually doing the mesh. This is also just a handy way to do it because uh, we're working with geometry and we don't have to worry about where the cells are and so forth. Um, so in this case, for this example, I have three materials. So what I do is I create a tuple of those materials. That's just a, an array uh, in, in Python um, that, uh, that generally can't be changed. Uh, and so I have a, I use the material group. All I do is need to give it a tag. That's a, a material ID or label value that we'll refer to within Pyleth and then give it the entities. That's the surfaces. So in this case, each of these arrays is a size one because each of my materials is a, just a different surface. So we have slab plate also referred to as crust within the pilot and then the wedge. And then I just loop over those materials and uh, create the physical group. Um, and this is a, a GMesh utility provided uh, routine that's associated with the material group. Uh, so this is not within GMesh itself, but within our GMesh utils module that's provided with Pilot. Vertex groups are how we mark the boundaries. 
So we create a vertex group for all of the four boundaries of the domain, as well as the faults and the ends of the fault, because we need to mark our buried edges. We give it a name of the group, the tag, that's the, a label value, what dimension of the group it's going to be, and the entities that are associated uh, with that dimension. So uh, we're working with a 2D domain. So our boundaries are a dimension of one lower. So they're a dim of one. We mark the end of the fault that's uh, just points. So it's a dim of zero. We give them unique tag uh, values for all of those. Um, and then we just say which curves uh, are on that boundary. So like the X negative boundary has two curves, both the hanging wall and foot wall. Uh, the Y X positive has just one curve, Y negative one curve. The Y positive, the top surface is composed of, uh, here we have three different curves. Then the fault has an upper and lower portion above display fault, below display fault. Um, then we have just, we mark that point on the end um, and then the splay and the end of the splay. And anything that we wanted to save in terms of being able to refer to when we mark the boundaries from creating the geometry, we need to store within the object. And that's why we're referring to all of these as self dot uh, the tag um, because uh, we're in a different uh, routine. And so in order to be able to refer to things, we can't use just local variables. We need to use names that have been saved uh, within the object. For each of those groups, I just look up, loop over the groups and call our GMesh util routine, create physical group. Uh, and that marks the boundaries. Um, and so now we're going to generate the mesh. Uh, so if we have all of the geometry uh, created and marked, then we can have a routine to actually generate the mesh. Um, and so the first thing we do is we're gonna, we're gonna set the mesh size based on a, a discret, we're gonna set the discretization size with the geometric progression with distance from the fault. So we turn off all of the default uh, mesh sizing options within GMesh. And we can use uh, within GMesh, these fields, which um, we're going to create a field that's the distance from the fault. So uh, here we add a field and we're going to call it fault distance. Uh, and it, we tell GMesh that this is, we're going to use a distance calculation. And then what we do is we said uh, within our field, we say, here are the curves from which you're going to calculate that distance. And so it's going to be the distance from our main fault. So we have two curves, the upper and lower curve. And, and once we have that, we have a field, fault distance, that is the distance from the fault. It's as simple as that. It's very powerful. Um, and it's uh, much more powerful th than uh, some of the entities within qubit for calculating uh, mesh size. Um, now we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to use that distance field to compute the discretization size. So we're going to create another field called field size, and we're going to use a mathematical function that computes the, uh, the uh, mesh size with distance. And within our GMesh utilities, we have a specialized function that does this geometric progression. Um, it's called uh, get math progression. We give it uh, the field that we're going to use, field distance, a minimum discretization size. In this case, it's going to be two kilometers, and then a bias that's the geometric progression. And so this will increase element size 5% uh, as you go uh, at each cell with distance from the fault. Uh, and then this is telling GMesh uh, how to make use of that mathematical expression. The F means a function. Um, and then we just say, set that as the background mesh size, which is the field size. Um, and then it will create uh, the mesh size and discretize it based on that background field. Uh, and so it's as simple as that. It's very, within about eight lines of code, we can compute distance from a fault and set a geometric progression. And as we go to qubit, you'll see that this is uh, a much simpler approach and, uh, and potentially uh, much more powerful in most situations. Uh, if we are going to do a quad mesh, we have to set specific options because G mesh will generate a triangular mesh and then recombine it to form quadrilaterals and an unstructured mesh. Uh, 
For a, a simple triangular mesh, we just say generate a 2D mesh. Uh, and in either case, we'll do a Laplacian 2D smoothing. And at the end of our script, we just say, well, we'll call our main function and then it'll generate the mesh. Um, so this is the Python script on how to generate the mesh. Now, let me show you how we actually use this Python script uh, to generate the mesh. So we'll bring up our terminal window here, uh, clear our screen. The generate dmesh script is right here within our directory. If you do dash dash help, oops. Pardon me while I need to reload our setup. Need to go up two more directories. Okay, there we are. So generate mesh, help. It'll take a couple seconds to load up the Python interpreter. So the steps you can do are run just the geometry, mark just the boundaries and do the geometry. Also generate the mesh, write it out. We can specify the, the name of the mesh and gmesh if you have if you're working in, in sort of multiple domains. Uh, specify the file name, tell it to write an ASCII file. The default is binary, the cell type, and then start the GUI after running the steps. So let's just run the, the geometry and load it up into the GUI. And it showed up in my other window. Let's increase. Uh, that screen size. So here you can see the different curves. And one of the, uh, if you look at tools and look at visibility, then we can bring in a window that shows all of our tool, all of our uh, uh, curves. And so you see all of our different curves and points. Um, and if you mouse over, you can get information about those points. Uh, to find the information, but you can see we have our boundary. You can see down here, this is point one, uh, point two, point three. Uh, that's the line, there's point four. And so you see information about the lines, the distance of those lines to double check that all of our geometry is exactly what we want. Uh, now let's run both the geometry and the marking and we'll load it up in the GUI. You'll see it just takes a couple seconds. Now, when I do tools and the visibility, it, when it loads things up, you'll see that now I have my different materials. And so if I click on these and apply, it'll isolate what my materials are. There's my wedge. And so you can, uh, oh, that's the X negative boundary. It's not going to show up on the screen because I'm covering it up. So you can double check that you've marked everything. For example, here's uh, the main fault. Here's the display fault. I can click on both of those, make sure that everything is lined up. So this works uh, quite well to check everything. Even before we've generated the mesh, we check to make sure that everything is marked appropriately. Um, for our boundaries. And you'll notice here that this is a specific uh, marking of those materials based on the tags um, that I gave it because this is how Pilot is going, needs to interpret the information that comes in, in from the mesh reader. Um, so we, it's marking, it's saying my, my material ID uh, and the label value, whereas all these others we can just use uh, names, but we need to keep track of uh, the number here, that's the physical tag um, number, and then the name. We'll re need to refer to both of these uh, when we're um, creating the mesh. I'm sorry, not creating the mesh, but using the mesh in Pilot. Okay, so let's generate our mesh. To generate our mesh, we don't have to say any. Uh, it'll automatically perform the previous steps. So we just say generate, and boom, there's our mesh. It takes just a fraction of a second to generate um, 
in the mesh. Let's zoom in. You can see we have the curves, and you'll see that uh, our fault surfaces are being honored. Uh, and we have when we zoom out, we see that our discretization size increases slowly with distance from the fault. So exactly what we want. So to just finalize to write that mesh out, all I have to do is is say write. Uh, and it'll automatically use the defaults. You can see that it optimized the mesh and wrote it out to mesh underscore try dot uh, msh. So that's it for the GMesh generation. We have our mesh. Now let's look at how we generate a very similar mesh within Qubit. So qubit geometry, we don't have to worry about orientation of curves, um, but we do have to uh, sort of worry about all the locations. And so uh, we have, in this case, I've changed the nomenclature just slightly that the points, instead of naming them by numbers, I've actually given them labels um, such as uh, just the location of like y pos, y x negative is the being the corner, just to make it a little easier to keep track of where these things are, exactly the same geometry. So I have started up my startup qubit. Uh, I am using a qubit directly from Sandia. So this is different than the core form qubit, but we believe that they are almost identical, but they are, there are slight differences um, of which we don't have a uh, complete documentation between uh, the government version of Qubit and the uh, uh, academic uh, private institution version of Qubit. Uh, I've opened up my uh, journal uh, file. In this case, it's uh, we're going to do the quadrilateral mesh. Um, and so the top level of my journal script, uh, I'm going to play the geometry script, do my mesh sizing, uh, which is in a different script called gradient. I will then run the mesh, do the smoothing, mark the boundaries, and then run it out. So essentially the same steps that we did in GMesh, only we're reversing when we mark the boundaries relative to when we generate the mesh. Um, so our geometry in this case, we could build it up exactly the same way we build it up uh, as we did in GMesh from points and the curves. Um, but in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, some geometric primitives uh, to make the block, and then we'll split the block into pieces to create our faults. Um, so the first thing we do is uh, within qubit, qubit supports use of units. So we can say units, we're going to use our SI. We reset the geometry. We mark uh, undo off to prevent uh, some stitching volume things. Uh, we say journal ID less on. ID less on. What that is, is that uh, this helps us make journal files that are independent of the geometry engine behind it. And so instead of identifying uh, items and entities by the ID, we identify them by the location. And this makes our scripts more robust and more portable across different versions of Qubit. Um, so if you are using Qubit, I strongly recommend using the idless uh, journals. Um, and you can do this, I believe, in both the journal files and Python. Um, so what we're going to do is we can just, within the journal editor, we can just highlight what lines we want to play. Uh, these, um, so we'll just play those first lines. It's nothing shows up on the screen because we haven't created any geometry yet. We've just set variables. Um, within uh, the qubit journaling, there's, uh, they have a, uh, a scripting extensions for variables, it's called apropos. Um, and so uh, we identify those entities by dollar signs. That's telling qubit that this is apropos language. And we set variables for the block height, block length, um, and the fault width, and so forth. And I believe, I'm gonna, oh, the, the block length. Uh, I believe is just being used. Um, that was a, so we're going 200 kilometers by 100 kilometers, but I believe in the, in the Z direction we create um, a, uh, and then we, well, we'll 
let's see, let's play these here. So we create a block, yeah. That's the, the block length is our, in the Z direction. And so that's why it's so short because we're just gonna create a 3D block and then split it on the mid surface to create uh, our, so here's our domain. Um, nothing shows up, uh, whoops, I need my, Keep it window back and I need my journal window. Where's my, there's my journal window. So I created the mid surface. And so I'm gonna delete the volume. And so I just have my mid surface, there it shows up. And I'm gonna create the fault by splitting the surface. So I have, I've saved my ID of the surface that I'm gonna call IDS. And now I'm just splitting it based on coordinates of points, just that. Uh, and so to create the fault, to highlight all of that, play it there. Um, oops, we'll minimize that window, come back to it. There I've created uh, my initial main fault surface. Then I can split curves. Oops. And now I can create my display fault, splitting curves based on the coordinates. There's my display fault. Now I'm gonna name all of those surfaces just so it's easy to refer to them. You'll notice that here is my original, so the surface nine named surface slab. Uh, those are all of the, um, that's what I originally wrote, but then the, the qubit spit out that I can, instead of referring to surface nine, my idealist version is to uh, actually do it based on coordinates. So let's name all our surfaces. Uh, and you'll see that there I have uh, my qubit. And if I look at my Sheet bodies, oh, there's my sheet body. Let's get it to unfold. Oh, there we go. Volume two, unfold. There's my, uh, what we call the slab, the plate, and the wedge. Then I can name curves. So I'm going to do it the same way. These are based all on IDs that then get translated into coordinates. So now I have names for all of my uh, curves, and then I also name uh, the points. So it's a little different. Normally, if I was building up from points, I, when I created the points, I would give them names. Here, I've started with the block, chopped it up by splitting, and so I name things after I'm created. Generally, it's a little easier uh, to if you really want to be consistent to build up from points into curves and the surfaces. Uh, however, that, that becomes much more difficult once you start getting into 3D. Um, but here's our geometry. We've marked everything. We have names for all of our curves. We have our um, surfaces just exactly the same uh, as we did in, in GMesh. And so uh, let's go through. We've completed our geometry. Now we can create our mesh. So we just set a discretization size of uh, two kilometers. Then we do our gradient. So we need to define our distance. And so here is, uh, we set the same bias factor of 1.05. Then we have this formula here that uh, provides what the discretization size should be based on a curve, based on its starting point the length of the curve and the bias factor. This is uh, just based on a geometric progression um, and solving for, uh, based on the length, what would you expect the discretization size to be at the end of a curve? It's the same, essentially the same formula we used in GMesh. Um, but in this case, we, uh, instead of being a, having it bundled within a Python script, we provide it here directly in the journal file. 
um, we, using the apropos language. Um, and so here we can say, here's my starting point. Here's the length of the curve. It's based on, we asked uh, Qubit to give me the length of the curve based on the name. It executes my function and I set what the discretization size is at a particular point. Um, so you'll see here in Qubit, we have to, for specifying the discretization size to grow with geometric progression from the fault, we're generally marking the mesh size all along the boundaries using their bias function. Um, and it's somewhat tedious and you have to keep track of where your starting points are, where your ending points are um, to set up all of this discretization size. So it's significantly more cumbersome than it is uh, within GMesh. Um, so there we set all of our variables, we reset our sizes. Uh, and so let's set the size on the faults, set the bias extending from the faults. We'll just uh, run this whole thing. And now if we go over here to our uh, meshing, we can say where the, uh, I need to get the right uh, function here. So we have a surface, we have our sizes, uh, Let's select all surfaces. I want a preview. There, oh, it's, uh, looks like we have a, I maybe didn't play the whole script there. Let's play the whole script. Because it looks like our mesh sizing. It's showing some bias, but it's not looking um, correct. So let's go back to the mesh. Let's make sure we start over and get everything generated. There we go. So I must have not uh, hit every single line um, in generating uh, the mesh sizing information. Now you can see I have a very fine discretization of the fault. It grows. Um, and so you see it on the boundaries where we set the discretization size. If I go over now and generate the mesh, there you can see my unstructured quadrilateral mesh. Uh, fine discretization right along the fault and then growing in size away from the fault. So I've generated my mesh. Now we'll smooth it. We generally within Qubit using condition number smoothing. Uh, so it didn't really do anything. You can see it's quite a good quality mesh. Now let's mark our boundaries. And so we first uh, create blocks from our surfaces. This is how uh, we create materials within Qubit. So let's mark all of our blocks. Those are our surfaces. So now if we go over here, we can go under blocks and see our three different uh, surfaces. And so our three different materials. Now let's go back. And so uh, within Qubit, for our boundaries, we create groups first and then create node sets. The groups we can do Boolean operations on, the node sets we can't. And so first we create groups and then we create node sets directly from that group. So we're gonna start with our two faults. Uh, we'll do, um, we say group fault, add the nodes in our curves, create a node set 10 uh, that's based on the group fault, give that name node set 10 the name of fault. Um, and so generally we name our node sets the same as our groups, uh, except if we have to do some sort of Boolean operation. So there, now I go under, can go under node sets and see my fault, see the orange uh, on top of uh, the yellow indicating that node set. I need to mark my buried edges. So um, here's the fault edge. It's just a single point in this case down here at the bottom. Uh, do the same thing for this play. Uh, and then I can mark my external boundaries in much the same way. And so I'll turn off 
the mesh, just show the geometry. Now I can look at my node sets and you'll see I have a bunch of nodes here along the fault. I have my end of the fault. I have the splay fault here, the splay fault end, boundary on the positive side. You see the little orange dots, boundary on the negative side, boundary on the Y positive and Y negative. So my boundaries, everything look marked correctly. And so we're done with our creating our boundary conditions. Come back here to our main mesh script. Um, and then we can export the file. Um, so play selected. And now I'll just play the whole thing. And you can see it all uh, show up here on. And if I show my geometry or show the mesh, there it is. So uh, that's how you generate the mesh in Qubit, quite similar to Gmesh. Um, slightly different user interface uh, within the journal file. It's a little more interaction uh, with the GUI interface um, to understand uh, doing everything. And you can play each piece by piece, uh, whereas Gmesh, we tend to run just with a single function within our Python script and check the results. So now let's get back to uh, running our example. So there's our uh, qubit mesh. The quadrilaterals here, I've marked things in the different materials. I've viewed, this is actually viewing the mesh using the pair view script that's included in the viz directory. So now let's focus on our simulations themselves. Um, so uh, our, uh, this is incorrect run reverse 2D. Uh, we'll be fixing that. Um, uh, we have a readme file that's a brief description of the various examples, our .cfg files, our pilot parameter files. We generate uh, the GMesh using this Python script that creates uh, the try underscore uh, msh file. That's the GMesh file. We have spatial database files that end in uh, .spatial db, a viz directory, and an output directory. Oops, there we are. Okay, so we're going to start with step five. It's just prescribed slipped on the main fault. We're going to have uniform slip of two meters. And you'll notice that I say minus two meters. So uh, in 2D, uh, our slip uh, components are left lateral and opening. And uh, because those are unique given our geometry, uh, and so if we want to reverse fault with an orientation like this, if we look across the fault, that is a right lateral slip. And so we have to, if left lateral is positive, right lateral is negative. And so we specify a slip of minus two. We'll have roller boundary conditions on the two, on all uh, of the three lateral uh, and bottom boundaries. Uh, what does this look like in terms of uh, the physics? Our solution field has both the displacement and the Lagrange multiplier. The Lagrange multiplier comes from our fault implementation. We're solving simple static el elasticity without any body forces. And so we just have the divergence of the stress equal to zero. We're gonna have on our uh, two lateral boundaries, the X displacement equal to zero, the bottom boundary, the Y displacement equals zero. And then we're gonna specify slip on the fault. How does this translate into simulation parameters? Well, for our solution field with both displacement and Lagrange multiplier, we need to select uh, a suitable set of, of uh, solution subfields. So we set that we, this is a predefined container that contains both the displacement and the Lagrange multiplier. We're going to use a default quadrature order of one, and that's consistent with our basis order. So linear functions uh, in terms of uh, linear variation of displacement and the Lagrange multiplier uh, displacement within the cell, the Lagrange multiplier along the fault has a linear variation. Um, we could use a, a basis order of two in this case, um, but uh, it's generally a relatively smooth sim, uh, solution. So we'll just use a basis order of one. Uh, in terms of translating uh, the use of the governing equation into materials, we're going to have um, simulation parameters create our materials. 
Then we create our, uh, for each array of three materials, then for each material, here we're gonna, we're gonna do the materials for the slab. We give description. This label value matches the label value uh, within, that we used in the GMesh. I should mention we're going to use the GMesh uh, mesh for our example. Then uh, we set our auxiliary field for the material. That's where it contains all the material properties. We're going to use a simple spatial database, mat elastic underscore spatial DB. Uh, we then have uh, what the discretization of those properties is. Are they're uniform? So we use a basis order of zero. Uh, and then our output, uh, our derived subfields, our Cauchy stress and strain, we're going to need a basis order of one. Uh, this is uh, oversampling um, but with our displacement basis order of zero, um, but it works uh, fine. For our boundary conditions, we have three boundary conditions. So we have an array of three boundary conditions. They're all Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions. They're all zero. So uh, in this case, I'm showing just the X positive. This is the label. That's the name of the physical group in GMesh. Then the tag is, corresponds to the label value. Uh, so X positive had a tag of 11. Uh, the X de positive degree, for X positive boundary, we're constraining the X displacement. So that's degree of freedom zero. We're going to use a zero dB, which automatically sets values to zero and we give a description um, and we're gonna have, uh, it's uniform, so we use a basis order of zero. For the fault, we have a single fault in this case. We have, uh, it's uh, marking within GMesh. It had the name of the physical group was fault. Its tag was 20, so that corresponds to label and label value. The buried edge, uh, which we need to mark whenever we have a, a fault ending in the middle of the domain. Uh, its uh, physical group name is fault end. It had a value of 21 for the tag. Uh, we're going to output just slip. And uh, for the earthquake rupture, uh, it's uniform slip. So we, so we use a uniform DB. We give a description, the values, initiation time, the final slip left lateral, uh, and opening. So it's going to start at zero seconds, have uh, minus two meters. That's uh, reverse slip, uh, and then uh, no fault open. Um, so our input files are mesh underscore try, uh, that's the gmesh file, the pilot app file, step five, uh, one fault, and mat elastic dot spatial db. So let's look at those files in more detail to give you a bigger picture view of um, what we have, so let's start with the pilot app file. I'm looking at it here uh, within Visual Studio Code. This gives the syntax highlighting, uh, which makes it much easier to read our spatial DB files. So let's start at the top. Uh, we give it our uh, metadata for all simulations within uh, this directory. So we say it's an example, we're in 2D. Some of the features we're using, triangular cells, uh, we're reading in from GMesh, so we're going to use the Mesh IO Petsy reader. Uh, it's a time dependent problem. We're using Dirichlet like time dependent conditions. We're using both simple DB, zero DB. We're going to output the solution on the boundary. We're using HDF5. So those are all the features and components we're going to use. Now we're going to give it the names of journal info files or info uh, uh, object names. So this is what information is actually going to be written to standard out. So uh, we'll have information come in about the time-dependent problem, the solution, the mesh reader, the material, the Dirichlet uh, time-dependent boundary condition, the fault, as well as the Petsy options. Um, if this is too much output for you, you can uh, turn all of these off or just turn off them individually. So this really gives the user ability to control how much information is written. Uh, we use the journal info files, there's also debugging files, uh, uh, or sorry, debugging flags um, uh, for debugging journals that can turn on a lot of information that helps in debugging to know where exactly you are. Um, and this is mainly for development of the code, not for running simulations. Uh, our mesh generator, we're reading, we're using GMesh, so our reader is mesh IOPetsy. We give it the name of the file. Uh, 
the reader has a coordinate system. The default is Cartesian to, uh, coordinate system. We need to, the default is a 3D Cartesian uh, coordinate system. So we have to tell it that the spatial dimension is two. Now for our, in terms of defining our problem, we're gonna tell it to use the nonlinear solver, even though this is just a linear problem. Uh, this helps show us that our residual and Jacobian are consistent. If it doesn't converge in a single iteration of the nonlinear solver, then it suggests something is wrong. We're gonna use a default quadrature order of one, default basis order of one for our displacement field. Uh, we're gonna output, uh, we, our output for the solution we, is done in terms of observers. Uh, we're going to observe the solution over the domain as well as a boundary. And uh, so for the boundary, we have the default is to is the domain. And so for our boundary uh, observer, we have to give it uh, the type and tell it's the output over the solution of the boundary. Before that boundary, we have to tell it which boundary it is. So that corresponds to the physical group name and tag within our GMesh Python script. We're going to observe on the ground surface, which is the plus y boundary and that has a label value of 13. We then have our materials. Uh, now I've changed plate to being uh, naming it crust. So we have slab crust wedge. We'll make this consistent uh, once we get uh, clean up this example a little more. So a slab, I've already gone through uh, the, the slab settings. Um, the label value here corresponds to the physical tag within GMesh. Same thing for the crust. This crust, this is a label value of two. Again, we're going to use the same material properties for all three materials just to make it easier. Um, there's the wedge, again, the same value of the simple spatial database. Here's our boundary conditions. We have already gone through one of those. Here's the x negative. Here's the y negative. So you notice on the y boundary, our degree of freedom or constraint is one instead of zero. Uh, and that's it for our pilot app file. Now let's go to step five. And so we have metadata specific to step five. So we have our description, reverse prescribed slip with zero displacement deer site boundary conditions. Uh, original author, Charles Williams, reverse slip, prescribed slip or keywords. Here are the arguments. This is exactly what you need to run. And we don't need that argument anymore. We'll delete that. Uh, which version of the example this is, this is 1.00, which version of pilot it runs, additional features, this is a static simulation with elasticity, fault cohesive, uh, kinematic source step, that's the default slip time function, so it's just a step function, um, which is what we want for a static simulation. Okay, output, we're dumping our parameters to um, uh, this file name, we're going to show our progress. Not very interesting for a static simulation because it can't update uh, more than once. And uh, our default name, all of our output files will begin with step 05 underscore one fault. Uh, as I mentioned in our previous slide uh, about the solution, now that we have a fault, we need a solution with both the displacement and the Lagrange multiplier. We have a predefined container uh, to create the solution with those subfields. Uh, and you can see a list of all the different containers in the, doc, in the pilot manual. We have our basis order of one for both the displacement and Lagrange multiplier. Now all that's left, we've done our materials, we've done our boundary conditions, all we have to do is specify the fault information. Uh, and so we have our label, our edge, um, we're gonna observe the slip. Now to specify the um, slip for the earthquake rupture. It needs the initiation time for the step function. We need an initiation time of the step function and then the amplitude of the step function. So uh, left lateral slip of minus two to give us reverse slip, no fault opening and have it occur at time t equals zero. So that's it for all the parameters. Now let's look at the mat elastic file to show uh, what our spatial database information here. The first thing we notice is we're giving it one point. So that's a data dimension of zero. Uh, this corresponds uh, to a uniform database, but because instead of repeating this information with a uniform database at three places within the .cfg file, we can encapsulate all this information into a simple DB file with a single point uh, specifying uniform parameters. Uh, the coordinates 
when I only give it one point don't matter. So I just give it zeros. Uh, and then this is, you can see density, shear wave speed, P wave speed. Uh, so density of 2,500 uh, kilograms per meter cubed, shear wave speed of 3,000 meters per second, and a P wave speed of 52, uh, 92 uh, meters per second. So Poisson elastic. And so that's it for the spatial database. Very simple when you have just a single point. Uh, you just need to be careful that, yes, I have three values, density, VSVP, their units. Number of locations is one, means a data dimension of zero. 2D for the space dimension, and then details about what coordinate system I'm using in 2D. Uh, two meters, just as the conversion of uh, the X and Y coordinates into SI units. Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter because I just have one point. Um, so that's all of our input files. Now let's run this example. So here I am over in my directory. Let's run pilot step 05. So there it's running, it spits out a bunch of information to the screen. And so let's scroll up to the top. So the first thing it did is it said it's reading its mesh, gives us the bounding box. Just one way to check to make sure that we haven't done something silly in generating our mesh. Uh, it says it's pre-initializing the fault. Then we are going to do uh, minimal initialization of the solution, minimal initialization of our different materials, then our boundary conditions, then our fault. We verify problem configuration. It gives us the scales that it's being used in the non-dimensionalization, length scale of one kilometer. That's what we would expect. Uh, it's consistent with the, uh, our discretization that's on the order of a kilometer. Time scale of 100 years is a static problem, so it doesn't really matter. Pressure scale that's on the order of our shear modulus. Density scale for quasi-static problems is extremely large. That's consistent with uh, neglecting inertia. Now it's going to tell us what Petsy options it's, it's being are being used. So let's go down here to uh, it's you, the preconditioner type is field split. It's with a fault. It's using factorization that's a lower precondition of self p. Then you can see for the different fields. Here's my displacement and Lagrange multiplier. The preconditioners on each of those blocks is going to be the LU preconditioner is it's only going to do it uh, in the in the sort of the, the pre only means it's only going to do it once and reuse it. We don't expect anything to change, so that works quite well. Here's our uh, the KSP that's the linear solver tolerances. Uh, we tell it yes, tell uh, the reason why it converged, trigger an error if it's not converged. These are all the defaults. Uh, same thing sort of for the nonlinear solver. Uh, tell me why you converge, trigger an error if you don't converge. Uh, we're going to turn the monitor on so at least so at least so at each nonlinear solver iteration, it's going to spit out uh, what the uh, solver tolerance is or, or sorry, the residual value is. Um, then finally we get down to solving the problem. Here is our time stepping monitor uh, that is turned on. Uh, by uh, the default Petsy option right there. Our nonlinear solver initial residual is 10 to the minus two. We converge in 43 iterations due to reaching the absolute tolerance for the linear solver. Our nonlinear solver residual tolerance is now 10 to the minus 12. It uh, met the absolute tolerance convert, uh, convergence criteria. We got to a time step of uh, 0.01 and it finalized the problem. And so this is non-dimensionalized scales. Um, so uh, we went one year in our time scale of um, 100 years. Let's look at the results of this simulation. So we're gonna load up ParaView. 
Uh, I've already started peer review. We need, uh, and we're going to use the, the Python script to visualize the results just so to save myself from typing. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to tell it down here within the Python shell the name of the simulation. So step 5011 fault. We're going to say field component to plot is X. And then we can run the script. It'll load up uh, within the current directory. We're going to click this plot displacement warp. It automatically uh, loads up the file, does the warping, and annotates the time. And we can zoom in here. And so you see it selected our X displacement. That was the field components. We have a nice contrast in displacement across the fault. We had uniform slip, so we have uniform sort of uh, contrast in, and jump in displacement across the fault. Sharp uh, stress concentration, just uh, not resolving very well down here where we have a very abrupt transition from two meters of slip to zero uh, at the bottom edge, but you can see we're getting uplift. We can click here on the warping. Change the default is a factor of a thousand. Let's bump it up just to really to a four thousand. That will give us. Now you can really see that uh, our reverse fault. We have the right motion. You can see how we're getting uplift uh, close to the surface trace on the hanging wall side. On the foot wall side, we have um, movement to the left. We have a little subsidence here right above the bottom of the fault. Uh, so this is exactly what we expect, zero displacement on the boundaries, um, uh, which is not our, notice our color scale isn't centered at zero. If we switch this to the magnitude of the displacement, you can see uh, we have zero displacement on the boundaries. Um, and so our simulation ran as expected. And so we will reset our pair of you, so it's ready for our next simulation. Now we're gonna cover uh, going from one fault to two faults, and uh, we'll see how that changes our input file. So we ran our simulation, we visualized the results, and now let's go on to step six. Now we're gonna put one meter of reverse slip on the display fault and keep our two meters a reverse slip on the main fault. Uh, so uh, similar setup in terms of physics, we have our um, solution field, which is same, same as step five, materials governing equation, same as step five, boundary conditions are the same. Now the difference is that we have two faults instead of just one. So now we need to create an array of two faults interfaces. Uh, we always give the main fault the through the one that uh, is the th is the longer of the two faults at the inter at the t intersection first, uh, and then we give it the second one. This prevents the second one from interfering with the creation and, and the topology of the first one. Um, and see the troubleshooting tutorial for an example of what happens if you reverse this and how to correct it. Um, and so for our main faults, we have the same information as we did before. And oops, there we are. Uh, one thing to point out is in the geometry of this problem, here we are, is our wedge is separated from our Dirichlet boundary condition. So uh, we inform, uh, we apply our, uh, implement our fault interface conditions in the weak sense. So this wedge is sort of floating in space. It introduces a null space into the problem. And so we need to use an appropriate conditioner that can handle that. Uh, so we need to change from the default preconditioner. So for the displacement field, we use the ILU preconditioner um, instead of the LU, LU preconditioner. And so this is an incomplete factorization to deal with that null space. Input files, step 06, two faults. Uh, and we have um, our um, elastic uh, uh, material properties, same as before. Uh, we specify uniform slips, so we don't have any additional spatial databases 
associated with our faults. So let's go look at our input file. We won't look at the pilot app file because it is unchanged. So let's look at step six. Uh, and so let's go down. We again, we just update our output names to be step 06 to false elastic. We have the same uh, solution uh, in terms of using the, the displacement and Lagrange multiplier, same quadrature order, same basis order. Uh, here are two faults. So we'll skip over the first one. Now we'll go down to display one. So it's label and end value or splay and splay end. Again, output slip. Now, instead of uh, two meters of reverse slip, we're just going to do one meter. Default component or the components are specified in terms of left lateral slip in 2D to get for the R geometry. We need right lateral slip to get reverse slip. And so uh, we have minus one meters. And here's our specifying uh, the fact that we're using the ILU preconditioner. So very similar to what we had for one fault. We just have an additional section here um, where we create. Uh, the array of two interfaces, we repeat the information for this first fault, and then we add a set of information uh, for the second fault. The major complexity in terms of the solver is the fact that we need to use incomplete factorization. So let's run the problem. And so pilot step 06. So scroll up, it's going to print out pretty much the same information for the first part. Now, when you get down to the faults, when it initializes the fault, you'll see that there's two of them. Uh, same scales for non-dimensionalization. You'll see that uh, when it comes through the Petsy options, it'll say that it was ignoring uh, setting the um, the displacement PC type to LU because it was already set because we, as a, in our user file, specified to use the incomplete LU factorization, the ILU. Um, our solver uh, with the uh, ILU preconditioner, it does not uh, work nearly as well. So it took 415 iterations instead of uh, just a few. And, uh, but we end up with a SNES residual tolerance of 10 to the minus 13. Um, and so our problem converged. Let's look at the solution. So now we need to update our, the name of our simulation. So we're going to do step 06 underscore two faults. Run our displacement work script. What did I? Oh, it's two faults underscore elastic. So it said it couldn't find the. Um, the file name. Now it should find the file name. There we go. It read it up. Open. Now, when we zoom in, we need to make sure we're in 2D. Zoom in. We can look at our wedge. You can see we have uh, contrasts in uh, displacement or jump in displacement across the splay fault as well as the main fault. We see the X displacement, we get more on uh, the hanging wall of uh, the splay fault. Then we have this nice, this wedge sort of just gets pushed up and to the right. And we have our nice X displacement all along the length of our, our main fault. So this is exactly what we'd expect based on our parameters. Uh, and we could add Additional faults, if we wanted to, we could make these slip distributions more complex. Um, but what we're going to do next is we're going to, instead of doing just a static simulation, we're going to do a quasi-static simulation, and we're going to see the relaxation of uh, what we call the slab. This chunk of the material over here will keep the top to the wedge and the crust uh, elastic. So all we're going to do is do the same problem, but now we're going to make 
one of the materials uh, a linear Maxwell viscoelastic and switch uh, to having a time stepping in our problem. So let's go back to our slides. We ran the simulation, that's what it looked like. So step seven, same as step six with the linear Maxwell viscoelastic bulk biology for the slab. So now uh, we have a time dependent problem. So we're gonna say an initial time step of four years. We're gonna start at minus four years so that the first time step gets us to output will be at zero and time of a hundred years. Um, so we'd expect 26 time steps. We're gonna give a, a very short relaxation time. So uh, of 20 years uh, within the, the, the viscosity of the slab. So we're gonna use now a uh, relaxation time of 20 years to non-dimensionalize our time scale. Uh, our material, now our slab, uh, we have to change what the bulk rheology is. Its material type is still elasticity because we're, that's the equation we're solving, but the bulk rheology within the elasticity is now isotropic linear Maxwell instead of being isotropic linear elasticity. We're gonna have a simple uh, spatial database for the material properties. Now we're gonna use a different spatial database, uh, Matt underscore Maxwell. Uh, it's the properties are uniform, so we still have the same basis orders. Um, and you'll notice here I've designated that we're gonna have the same elastic properties in the crust and wedge um, as in the slab, but now for the slab, we've added a viscosity. We have our same boundary conditions and the same fault conditions as in step six. Uh, again, we need to use the ILU preconditioner. Now our input files, we have our mesh file, our pilot app file, our simulation parameter file, in this case, step seven, two faults, Maxwell. We still have our elastic properties for the wedge and the crust. And for our slab, we're gonna use a different spatial database that adds in the viscosity. So let's look at uh, the step seven file. So again, we have our metadata uh, with the description. Uh, now we're gonna just change the names. Now we have our time stepping information as I just showed uh, in that excerpt on the slide. Again, our solution field has displacements from Lagrange multipliers. We don't, our pilot app file specified uh, the material properties for elastic properties. We only have to override the ones for the slab uh, to change what its values are. Uh, and really we wouldn't have to change what the type of the spatial database we did here just for completeness. Um, this way, uh, if you tend to sort of don't show what you intend and just use other values, you'll get confused if you change it one place but not change another. So if we'd used like a if we'd used a uniform database in the pilot app file, then I would definitely have to provide. Um, but this is just a it's a one additional line and it just makes it clearer that yes, this spatial database file is a simple DB and makes it easier to read. Uh, along with the description, now we have updated our description to be maxwell viscoelastic properties instead of just elastic properties. Same fault information, so I won't cover that same uh, Petsy information. So let's look at our Matt uh, viscoelastic file. So Matt Maxwell, um, it has uh, also uniform value. So num locations is one, day dimension is zero. Now, instead of just density, VS and VP, I have to give it the viscosity. And then I also have to give it uh, values for our state variables because our auxiliary file field holds both the property information as well as the, uh, the state variables. This is how you can specify initial state variables for your, uh, for your problem. Uh, because we don't care about what the initial state variables are, we just give them all zeros. Here's our viscosity, 1.5 e to the 19th. Uh, same elastic properties. Uh, these are just comments here. Uh, to show uh, just, it's a handy reminder that these are in the same order as these up here and the column identifiers, um, just to make it easier to read. Uh, so that's the input parameters for this example. Just a slight greater complexity. We now have time stepping. Uh, 
And so we'll start up, run the simulation. Now you'll see it's time stepping through about three on the order of 300 to 350 iterations uh, with our ILU preconditioner. We ran 26 time steps. You'll notice it advanced all the way up to uh, five times our relaxation uh, time of 20 years up to 100 years, which is what we wanted. Non-dimensionalized time step of 0 0.2. So let's look at our simulation. Now we can look at some time dependent results. Let's set our simulation name. Uh, it's step seven, two faults Maxwell. Rerun our displacement script. And you can see now why uh, we don't wanna go through the GUI interface for every single simulation. It's much easier to have a Python script that you can quickly load up uh, the results for. Sorry, 2D, zoom in. Now I can hit the little play button up here and you'll see, you can see the time dependence. So we get relaxation within the slab over here. It's relaxing the, uh, the deviatoric stresses. You can see we have much more deformation on sort of the, on the foot wall side of the fault. Um, and we sort of generally, and we keep sort of the, the same displacement field up here in our elastic material. The relaxation is occurring down here in what we call the slab material. We can load up our, uh, the, that slab material. So we can look at, we got to go all the way down to step seven. And Maxwell, let's look for the slab. Here's the slab material. We need the XDMF reader. Let's turn off the warping. We can keep the time. Apply it. Bring in, here's our material. Let's rewind all the way. Let's do, let's see, not Cauchy strain. Let's do stress. It's the components are XX, YY, ZZ, XY. So we can start up. Unless we have a very large stress concentration at the end of our fault. Let's reset the scale. Now we'll play. And you can see the shear stress is uh, relaxing away. In our 25 time steps. So that's what's happening uh, in terms of the stress field uh, with our viscoelastic relaxation. So let's wrap up this. Uh, tutorial, there is our visualization of the results, which I just showed. And that concludes these quasi-static simulations uh, using a reverse fault uh, with prescribed slip.